Let it tell me it started the recording. Very good. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Ken Rosenthal. And I'm a park naturalist with Gulf Branch Nature Center. And um, tonight we are going to talk about who needs cherry trees. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and get the PowerPoint started. Um, oh, before I do that, one thing. Um, I When I do share the screen and, and show up on PowerPoint, <clears throat> I can't really see what's going on in the chat. So I usually get back to that at the end. Um, this is a, a program for adults and we are all adults here. So if you've got a question and it really needs answering at that moment, please, by all means, unmute and grab my attention. And I'll try to answer it then. Um, or if it waits till the end, um, that's fine as well. I don't want to miss out on answering your question because uh, we waited till the end. So uh, here we go. <laughs> All right, so um, I, I think that you know pretty much anybody uh, that lives in this region knows what March and April means, and that means cherry blossoms. Uh, we have a, a nice rich tradition. Uh, it's been going on, if I remember the date correctly, um, it's 1912. I didn't do a lot of studying on the Cherry Festival because I want to talk about our native cherries, um, but it's important to note um, what we have here, and, the, and these cherry trees uh, are beautiful. They are uh, as, as what I could find is Yoshino cherries, uh, and there's there's some debate over whether they are uh, a native hybrid. They're a hybrid, uh, hence the, the scientific name that they have here, uh, and they are a hybrid between two different types of, of cherry trees. Uh, and there's uh, some questions about whether that was uh, a human influenced hybrid or a natural hybrid. Uh, they seem to uh, grow by themselves um, in Japan now. Uh, they are one of the most uh, cultivated and widespread of the cherry trees because of, of that allure. Uh, obviously, you know, we have many of them uh, in our region as well. Uh, and there's beautiful, there's no doubt about that. Um, I did try to find some kind of ecological notes on the species and really couldn't. Um, this is one of those subjects where when you do a, an internet search, it is pretty much wall-to-wall uh, -wall cultivation and gardening tips and I just wasn't able to find that although I did find someone who you know took the time to say that robins and thrushes will eat the fruits of the um, the Yoshino cherries in the in the region uh, when they come through and I'm sure there's there are several uh, urban uh, species of birds and mammals that will take advantage of that food crop when it's there um, so one thing to note about that uh, scientific name is that that genus uh, is Prunus. And it's a genus that includes the plums, cherries, peaches, nectarines, apricots, almonds. I know you guys can read. Um, you know, these are all fruits that have a, a pretty big stone in the middle. <clears throat> um, and the one that we're going to be talking about today, I'm actually going to focus on our, our native um, cherry trees and, and its uh, ecological um interactions and associations and that is the black cherry which is prunus serotina um and this is a nice one in a wide open space they they do okay in in sunlight um they have a uh pretty i hate to say boring but pretty standard oval leaf i don't use the leaves to identify them and sometimes the leaves are, are can be pretty glossy um i use the bark if you've got a mature black cherry tree that bark looks like uh burnt potato chips that is a description that I have held with me for several decades. I'm loath to say that because it's it, it goes back to college, but I remember taking a tree ecology in the fall quarter, and by the time we started, the trees were already starting to lose their leaves, and our professor was like, "I can't look at the leaves anyway. The leaves aren't going to help you. You know, if you're looking at the leaves on the ground, it could have come from any of these trees. You got to tell it by the bark." And he just turns, starts walking through the woods, slapping trees and and, and they'll, naming them all off by bark. And I can remember two to this day. Uh, there's only two that really stuck with me. And the one that that is far have been has been much more helpful is that burnt potato chip, that thick burnt potato chip um, texture of the black cherry. So if you've got a mature black cherry, um, you know, and you can see that that bark, you don't even need to look up at the leaves. It's it's a pretty uh, telling identifier for that tree. Um, so let's get to know our black cherry a little bit before we talk about um, who actually needs it. There are several species of wild cherry in North America. It is easily the largest of them. Uh, most of them don't get out of the you know, the the uh, small to medium tree range. This is a it can be a, a very large tree. They like dry to mesic forests. They don't like really wet, but they can tolerate uh, a moderate amount of moisture, uh, and they can be cold hardy. There are there's something called 
if I remember correctly, frost pockets where there are cold s spaces where uh, some trees will struggle in cold weather to, to live in these areas, but um, the black cherry is fairly cold hardy and can exploit those areas. Um, they do like woods, thickets and edges. They will take advantage of an open space in a canopy or along the edge of a, of a forest, um, you know, next to a field. Um, and as a result, or perhaps because of their ability to tolerate both full sunlight or be shade, to shade tolerant, uh, they can take um, advantage of those areas. Um, you know, a young cherry sapling will grow quite well uh, in full sunlight, uh, and they can also grow uh, under a canopy as, as a shade tolerant smaller tree. When they get older, they lose some of that shade tolerance uh, as they approach um, the size where they reach the canopy, and so they don't do as well uh, at later ages as, as a shade, as uh, they don't do well up in the canopy um, being shaded as well as they did as a younger tree. I'm not sure why, what changes or what happens as they get older. Um, uh, a young uh, black cherry has a tap root, which is a single large uh, root that's kind of the base there and that, that can make them very steady. But as they get older, uh, that tap root kind of disappears or doesn't really keep growing and, and then they uh, switch to more of a lateral root system where you've got a lot of roots going out um, the edges, but that can be a very shallow system uh, and that can make them susceptible to windfall. So, you know, if they're not sheltered by other trees, you know, that can make them very susceptible to uh, a strong, stiff wind or a storm. <clears throat> um, browsing, cutting, uh, fire all stimulate new growth. You know, if you can cut a, a cherry tree, um, you know, down to the stump, it will begin to sprout out of that stump. Uh, either that same season or the following season. Um, but if you go ahead and cut it again or burn it again, uh, that will likely do it in because it does require a lot of, of resource allocation uh, into those young uh, shoots coming up from the stump. Uh, and so that makes it much more susceptible to that same kind of um, uh, catastrophe. Uh, if that happens again, it, it's much more likely to kill the trees. So they are hardy, uh, but they do have limits. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, they're opportunistic. They'll take advantage of spaces, but that, but they are also long lived. You know, sometimes you'll have opportunistic species, but they get into an area, they take advantage of it quickly, and then they die off. Um, black cherries can be opportunistic, but they're still very long lived. They can, uh, you know, hit 150 to 200 years uh, in age. Uh, and then uh, their leaves and twigs contain high levels of hydrocyanic or prussic acid. So, no matter how inclined you may be. Don't go out and stick a bunch of black cherry leaves in your mouth. Um, I think one of the, the numbers I read was between 10 and 20 pounds of that foliage can be um, fatal for uh, livestock. And again, obviously humans aren't going to eat that that number, but um, you know, a, a pretty large grazing animal that spends a lot of time eating cherry leaves can get really, really sick to the point of, of a fatality uh, if they're um, concentrating all of that uh, prussic acid into their body. Uh, and then in, in both of these these facts here, this the um, prussic acid and this last one here about the leaf stalks uh, is going to come into play later with some of the uh, the, the organisms that are associated with it. <clears throat> their leaf stalks have these tiny double glands that secrete nectar and that can be really important for uh, smaller organisms that use nectar as a food source. Uh, these double glands can be be really um, desirable and something that really attracts them into the black cherry. Uh, these are the drooping flowers of the black cherry. They are insect pollinated. They're also um, bisexual, so there's not male and female leaves. They have both parts. Uh, and these are the um, uh, the fruits. Uh, and don't fool you, they're only about pea size. They're not really large fruits they're not what we think they're not the um cherries you might think of that you're grabbing at the store they're a little bit uh they're they're smaller um but they can still be a pretty significant food source for a, a lot of different kinds of animals so these are our black cherries um and this is the range of our black cherry you'll notice that they go all the way up into i'm pointing at the screen like you can see my finger um you can notice that they can uh go all the way up into um uh, uh, excuse me, Nova Scotia and, and New Brunswick here in, you know, Maine. Uh, we got a little bit of the southern part of Ontario here. 
uh, Mar uh, Maryland, Michigan, and Wisconsin, uh, and then down into the Gulf states, uh, not quite all the way through Florida and all along the uh, Atlantic coast. Um, if you'll notice, it, it, it stops here just west of the Mississippi, which is very similar in area to where the Great Plains are. This this inset map here with the, the red areas is, is, is um, the, the area that the Great Plains take up. And so uh, I'm wondering if that has something to do with it. And I, I did mention, you know, it can get pretty windy out there and I did mention that the older trees do not do well in wind. And so that that Great Plains there might be a limiting factor to their range. Uh, but you can see they sneak in around the bottom corner there. You get some um, spots in Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, some smaller local ranges here in, in Mexico and even down in the Guatemala. So um, it's a, there's a lot of places you can find uh, black cherry in North America, but this is where they're native. They have been, I believe, um, taken over and planted in Europe and naturalized there. I don't know if they've reached this, the um, the status of an invasive species in Europe, but you can find naturalized uh, American black cherry over in uh, Europe. Uh, their closest relative is not um, the, the commercial cherries that we would think of that would be really good for us, but it's actually uh, choke cherry, P Prunus virginiana, which is, I think, interesting that that's you know, got the Virginia name in it. Uh, there's so many um, ones that do. They have a also have a small um, fruit with a large seed. Um, and I, I've been told um, <clears throat> so when I worked in Denver, there was a lot of choke cherry there. And I've been told that it's because the seed is so big. They also have an astringent flavor. So and, and I'm wondering if that could be part of it too when they're, until they're ripe. Um, and the choke cherry is a very different range. You can see they're more of a northern species. A lot of this, the, the southern half of, of Canada, uh, across the northern states, and you can see through um, the uh, west end of the uh, plain. You know, they go through the the northern part of the plains. But you can also see some patches here and there through the uh, the Rocky Mountains as well. Uh, but they're definitely. Um, I remember them very well from in, in Denver because one of the things that you you do as a, a naturalist in the Denver area is you talk about black bear and mountain lion and black bears do a lot of feeding on choke cherries in I think it begins in like July is when the bears start preparing already for hibernation uh, and they go through a um, I want to say superphaging I don't think that's right but uh, a heightened amount of eating so their their appetite grows uh, and they're consume on average about 20,000 calories a day, which is, is a massive amount. I did some math and you can either go to McDonald's and eat 36 Big Macs or you could get uh, eight or more large pepperoni pizzas and that would be your 20,000 pounds for the day. I don't know about the Big Macs, but I, I'd be willing to give those pizzas a shot. Um, so, but that's a lot of feeding. And so again, if you imagine um, this bear eating those tiny little choke cherries, how much they have to do. And so what actually happens is during that time when these bears, which might be, could be very territorial the rest of the year, um, their, the importance of finding food takes over the importance of maintaining a territory. And so you can go into some of these areas where there's a lot of choke cherry and a lot of other wild fruits, uh, and you'll find the bears in higher densities than you normally would uh, because they tolerate each other more because they're more focused on the food. Uh, it's just like if you've ever been to Gulf Branch when the wood frogs are there and you get up close to the fence and they all stop calling, but at some point one of them's gonna start calling and they all start calling again because it's really, really important to find that mate. And if those big scary predators, that's us, aren't getting any closer, we're just gonna keep calling. Excuse me. So um, these wild fruits can be really, really important sources of food. Um, cherries aren't really loners. You're not going to typically find, um, and this also means they're not really, um, you know, that kind of birds of a feather idea where you're just going to find a stand of black cherry and that's it. You don't really find that. Um, so in a, in the sense that uh, what I'm saying here is that they're not really loners, that they're not typically just by themselves. They tend to spend a lot of time with other associates. So you're going to find them in, you know, these um, forests mixed with other species. Uh, upper left is uh, basswood and lower left is uh, northern red oak. We got white oak in the center here and upper right is, if I remember correctly, it's American elm and bottom right is, is red maple. So you got the maples, you got the elms, uh, oaks, basswood, white ash. These are all uh, associates you'll find in, in the same type of forest habitats with uh, black cherry. Uh, and again, typically you find a black cherry by itself. You don't find a whole bunch together. Or you might find a few, but not, you know, a really big stand. Um, so they, you know, with that bark, they can kind of stand out. And there's something else that make them stand out that I'll, I'll show a little bit later, a little bit later as well. 
Um, so mammals are big fans of the food. You've got a whole host of critters that are more than happy to scavenge the, the fruits from the ground. Uh, you know, we got the trifecta of squirrels here in the upper left is a uh, red squirrel, which I don't think are, are typically very common around here in more of a northern and, and, and western species. Um, but fox squirrel, eastern gray squirrel, they'll both eat, um, they'll happily eat the cherries. The um, cottontail will eat cherries. Um, red fox, white-footed mouse on the bottom, and eastern chipmunk on the right. Um, <clears throat> You know, I think some people get really surprised, but red fox take advantage of a lot of plant food and plant material during the summer. They'll eat fruits, they'll eat berries, they'll eat nuts. Um, they'll eat a lot of uh, uh, white oak uh, chestnuts, uh, chestnuts, excuse me, uh, white oak acorns as well. Um, so, you know, when that food source resources are there, they're going to eat a lot of that. Um, now, all these rodents and this rabbit here, these guys all become the main dish in the winter for the red fox. Uh, but at this time, they're you know, more than happy to take advantage of those those plant uh, resources that are out there. Um, the cherry doesn't have a big crop every year. I think every three to four years they'll have a bigger crop. Um, you know, so it comes and goes. But certainly when that's there, just like when you know, which oaks go through mast years and in, in, in very lean years, you know, they'll take advantage of that food. Um, that food source when it's there and when it's plentiful. So again, these are all critters that are, you know, ha you know, are going to be more than happy to eat uh, fallen cherries. And again, the squirrels certainly could climb and get some, you know, even the chipmunk. Um, but black bear, raccoon, these are two of our climbers. These are two critters that are going to be more than happy to climb up into that tree to to get the bear, the cherries, as you can see in this picture, to get those cherries out. Um, bears will leave a mess. You can't have a large animal like that go up in a tree without breaking a few branches. And so you might see scratch marks. You might see um, broken, bent, um, damaged limbs. And that can oftentimes be a really good indicator of um, a bear has been up in that, that cherry tree. And again, you know, knowing it's the cherry tree, knowing it's the time of year when the, the cherries are uh, ripe and ready to be consumed, you know, you can see that damage in a tree and, and figure out that's probably a, a good chance it was a black bear. Uh, and this black bear here, I believe this picture, um, as, as mentioned to, to you know, one of our group uh, earlier, I have discovered the NPS gallery of photos that are available. Uh, many of them are public domain that you can use. And uh, this is one of them. And this is actually, I think, taken in Shenandoah on National Park, this black bear eating the, the black cherry. So, you know, this stuff does happen in this area. Uh, and then who else is going to eat the cherries? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was speaking of mammals. This is a vole. Uh, I like to describe voles as uh, mice without long tails. Um, I don't always know that that's very fair to the voles, uh, but it's the quickest and easiest description I can think of. I'm sure there's a few other things that differentiate them from mice. But voles will actually um, use pathways under the, the snow when you get a snowpack and the snow begins to melt away a little bit from the ground because there is geothermal heat. Um, voles will use that and it's a really safe place for them and they'll actually come up from the snow just to that to the edge of where the snow is and they'll chew on the bark of uh, cherry during winter and so they'll actually feed on the uh, the cherry bark uh, during the winter. So apparently that um, if that prussic acid is there uh, in the bark, it's not something that really affects the uh, the voles too much. So that's one food source that they'll exploit during the winter. Um, despite what I said about humans and livestock, I, I have read I've read both that uh, white-tailed deer and moose don't do well with the foliage from black cherry, and I've read that it doesn't really deter them from browsing it. Uh, and maybe it's something that they get. You know, if they're browsing indiscriminately, they get a little bit in or out. Or, or out I don't know. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say, uh, just to cover my backside, that if you are illegally keeping a white-tailed deer or moose at your home, don't feed them any black cherry browse. Um, uh, but these are big grazers, and they could certainly, you know, um, take advantage of those leaves if it is something that wouldn't uh, make them sick. So and birds eat them too. Uh, I think you know when we see berries and fruits, and you know a lot of people think about birds, uh, and, and birds certainly will take advantage of those food sources. Um, these are both birds that can take advantage of them on the ground, although um, they are flighted and can certainly take them out of the tree if they wanted. Uh, rough grouse on the left and uh, ring necked pheasant on the right, which is a, a non-native species, uh, but they're both game birds. Uh, and you know, so having if you're trying to promote. Uh, you know, hunting in, in, in uh, the um, 
game birds in an area, black cherry is one of those trees that can be really important for them as a, as a food source. Uh, and there's a lot of birds that'll go right up in the trees to exploit it. <clears throat> um, going row by row, the uh, top row here is a roast breasted gross beak uh, and Baltimore Oriole on the top row. This is a downy woodpecker, but different kinds of, oh, you know, I'm sorry, let me try that again. Rose, best, rose breasted gross beak, the gross beaks will take care, will take um, full advantage of cherry trees. Orioles, this is a Baltimore Oriole, but Orioles will um, definitely eat cherries as well. Uh, woodpeckers, in this case, this is a downy woodpecker. Uh, in the middle, uh, tanagers, uh, scarlet and summer tanagers will eat the, the cherries. Uh, and bluebirds, this is an eastern bluebird, but it's not the only bluebird, they'll eat cherries. Uh, waxwings, like the cedar waxwing, and thrushes, in this case, a hermit thrush. Uh, but several different species of thrush, I mentioned the, the robin earlier, uh, wood thrush, you know, swainson thrush, these are all feed off of cherries, uh, either on the ground or um, from the tree itself. I did something and now it's not letting me. Oh, uh, and there's more than 70 species of birds. I forgot my little fancy word there. Um, there are more than 70 species of birds that will use uh, and or rather will feed from black cherry and eat those fruits. And when they eat uh, the fruit, they're not, you know, they don't pick it up and, you know, they hold it with their mouth and they're they're picking all the, that that flesh off and they leave the stone. Often they gobble the, the fruit whole. Because again, it's not that big. Um, it goes through their digestive system. They take the parts they want, which is the fleshy goodness with all the nutrition and all the good stuff. And then they poop out the seeds uh, and they are dispersing the seeds by doing that. Uh, and the seeds that go through the gut of a uh, passerine species, that's a flight, uh, the um, songbirds and most of these, these species you see here are passerine. If the um, seeds go through their gut, they're uh, by a percentage more likely to, I know how the percentage, but I know they, by some percentage, they are more likely to uh, successfully germinate than seeds that do not go through the gut of a bird. Just like something like, um, last night I was talking about uh, spring ephemerals, like when mayapple, if it gets, if the fruit gets eaten by um, box turtles, I think, I think it was like 30% more likely to successfully uh, germinate when it's, you know, gone through the gut of a, um, a box turtle. So whatever happens um, to be beneficial to that seed when it passes through the gut of a bird uh, certainly, uh, you know, can help it to be more successful. So, you know, the trees are providing a food for the birds, that fleshy outer covering of their seeds. Uh, the birds get that as a meal, and then they do the trees a favor by spreading those uh, seeds to other places so that they're not trying to grow right underneath the, the parent plant and can be a competition or, you know, a waste of resources because it's not going to grow very well and you wasted all the time making all the seeds and they didn't go anywhere. So having these uh, critters disperse them for you is, is really, really important. Uh, let's talk about some little critters. which are kind of my favorites. Um, if you find a black cherry tree, if you look hard enough, you will find a black cherry leaf gall. Uh, and that is these structures here, these nice purple ones. I um, put this one here. It's only two, but you can kind of see they can be start out green. They can be, you know, dark as they get older or they get disused. Um, typically with galls, what happens is some organism, uh, in this case, it's a, it's a mite. So these mites are biting the plant, uh, laying an egg. The egg is grown around uh, by tissues from the, the plant. And oftentimes... Um, they're essentially tricking the plant into growing this tissue around the egg. The young embryo of the organism in their hatches, it can eat the inside of this tissue, this this tissue mass, this chamber. Uh, it's protected in there, ideally. Uh, and then eventually it hatches or it uh, pupates into an adult and it leaves uh, and then it repeats the process. So they're tricking these plants into the trick in the um, the growth processes of these leaves into providing shelter for the little organisms that live in the inside there, their next generations. Uh, there are wasps that do this, there's mites, uh, there are some galls that are produced by bacteria and other organisms. So there's a whole host of these. In this case, this is a, a leaf gall mite. There are several kinds of gnats that also have this as well. So mites and gnats uh, will often produce these, um, these funguses on there. And there's several different kinds. This is, I think, one of the most common um, I think in iNaturalist, I have like a dozen different ones of these. Is I always find fun to to spot and enjoy. I think they're really neat. It's, I don't know the, how good it is for the uh, the leaf, but they're always kind of fun to spot. Uh, if you're not entirely sure, you know, I'm talking about mites. If you're not entirely sure, um, 
Hey, you keep doing this to me. If you're not entirely sure, sure what a mite is, this is a red velvet mite. This is not the mite that creates those structures. I don't think this is a gall producing mite at all. Um, but this will give you an idea. They're very, they're um, in um, the classification is a Akari and it's it's similar to arachnids or Araniae. There are arachnids and I think uh, it's similar to Araniae. Araniae is spiders. Um, so they're in that same group with spiders, but they are not spiders, but you can see they have the eight legs. They're very similar uh, in, in body plan, uh, but they're different. Uh, and before I forget, not all galls are safe. There are um, parasites that can take advantage of, of being able to locate these structures and then parasitize the, the developing creatures inside. There's a lot of wasps that are very good at doing this. There are wasps that create galls. There are wasps that parasitize the wasps that create galls. There are wasps that parasitize the wasps that parasitize the wasps that create galls. Um, I want to get myself down a really tough tough talking road there if I keep going um, but there's a lot going on and this is again this is a very small level I think you know a lot of people you see a, a fruit tree and you're like yeah there's some mammals that'll eat it and there's some birds that eat it, but there's a lot of other things going on as well that, that can be really interesting um, this is black knot this is a fungus uh, and it's really easy to spot this is actually spring but this is really easy to spot in the winter especially because you know you don't have that background of leaves and you see these odd sh odd shapes and, and dis, um, um, misshapen um, twigs, and this is black knot. Oh, what's really interesting about black knot is there are some insects that will use that as a shelter. They're called inquilines. Uh, that's not a classification. That is more of a um, descriptor like predator or prey. Uh, you know, predator or prey doesn't tell you what kind of uh, animal it is. It tells you what it eats. Uh, inquilines are animal are organisms that live inside of other living organisms. Uh, in this case, the inquilines could be like a dogwood borer, which is a type of Oh, if I remember correctly, this is a type of um, uh, moth, and they can get in there uh, and and use spaces in here to pupate uh, as part of their life cycle. So uh, these can be really, really important. And it's not just one. There's several, you know, species that will use these these growths on the the black knot on the cherry to uh, advance their life cycle, be part of their life cycle. Um, anyway, here's the disease cycle, and you can see it's it's spread by wind. So when you got the wind, and then if they land on a on a on a wet spot or film of water, well, they can germinate and begin the infection. And this can be a really uh, nasty thing. And you know, if you you've got a cherry, um, it's definitely in your best interest, I believe. You know, you can ask an extension agent on this. Don't take my word for it, but I think it's definitely within your best interest if you're if you're trying to keep this cherry healthy to uh, get rid of those limbs before it spreads to the to other parts of the tree uh, because those limbs I think will eventually die uh, from the from the black knots um, from the black knot infection uh, so let's talk some pretty insects we just did you know gall mites and uh, and um, a really dark fungus so let's talk some butterflies um, this is our state insect, the uh, eastern uh, tiger swallowtail. Got a little egg here up in the left corner. Uh, you got your larva, which is the caterpillar. Uh, they don't normally hang out on screens. This one was definitely moving to a location where it was going to pupate into its chrysalis before uh, completing its metamorphosis into an adult. Um, a lot of plant species can be really, really, are very important to host species because they can be um the host species for some of these some of their uh larva um and black cherry is no exception there are several different there are several butterfly species that will use um, black cherry <clears throat> as their host species not necessarily there are, i'm sure there's some exclusively but i think most of the ones i'm going to show you um black cherry is among the range of different host plants they'll use <laughs> oh excuse me <clears throat> this is uh red spotted purple I was actually looking for some information online and uh, a butterfly enthusiast was like the uh, inappropriately named red spotted purple, which is actually orange spotted with azure hues, um, which I guess you could have called it the orange spotted azure and I don't know why they didn't. Um, but this is a, it's a really beautiful butterfly and this is another one that um, uses uh, black cherry as the host plant for its caterpillars. And like I said, there's several. This uh, upper left here is not the monarch, but this is a viceroy. You can see that line through the panes on the on the rear wings uh, that differentiates it from monarchs. You won't see that line through the uh, orange panes on the rear wings of the monarch. Uh, so this is the viceroy. Uh, they were thought to be a um, 
imitator of the monarch because they weren't distasteful but the monarch was and they were trying to imitate but they are actually distasteful in their own right so now it's thought that they both have uh, evolved similar coloration because it re they reinforce each other um there are several species of silkworm uh, moth that use uh, black cherry as a host plant um, there are several species of acronicta which is a genus of moths called uh, called the dagger moss. This is the funerary dagger moth and uh, it's got one of the most remarkable caterpillars. This is one of my all-time favorite finds. This is a, a called a um, paddle caterpillar with all the, you can see all these little, these would essentially look like, you know, miniature um, canoe paddles, uh, structure, shaped structures sticking out uh, from the sides of it. Um, but this is on a cherry leaf, I believe. Um, and so they will use cherry trees as a host. This is a spotted Apatilodes uh, caterpillar, and over here is a banded tussock moth caterpillar. There are, you know, if you thought there was a lot of birds, there's about 450 species of caterpillars that will use black cherry as um, a host species. So black cherry can be a really significant, really important uh, component in, in a forest or, it, it, you know, in any kind of area, wild area that you're trying to promote um, some good biodiversity. Um, I got this picture of these really small and tiny little black cherry saplings. Um, I, I read this interesting um, uh, interview with uh, Doug Ptolemy, and one of the things he pointed out to the person was they were talking about black cherry and how important it was, and he showed the interviewer in his yard he had s several saplings of black cherry, and he was showing uh, the interviewer how many caterpillars you could easily find on there. And, and one of the things he pointed out was a lot of times they will use the smaller saplings or the smaller trees more readily because there's it's far less likely for their predators to be on there because you're not going to have a ton of birds landing on this small sapling. You know, the birds often are going to use the bigger, and more stable trees. And so this can be a, a much safer place because even though it's small and there's not as many leaves or as many places to hide on it, um, there are going to be far fewer um, caterpillar predators to hang out on that tree. And so using these younger trees is a really um, good way to avoid predation. So now we're not happy to see every associate that's hanging out on uh, a cherry tree. Um, this is one of my favorites. I am actually really happy to see this. I, I think these are really neat, um, but I also don't grow cherry trees. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I, I don't have a, 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 a I don't know, a dog in the race, I guess, not the best saying, but it's not, you know, something I, I get overly concerned with. These are eastern tent caterpillars. Um, They're very social. You know, they hang out in these nests. They go in the nest when there's danger or at night. Uh, you can see all these dark little things. These are not little mini caterpillars. This is called, this is all poop or frass, F-R-A-S-S. -S. Frass is a nice scientific word for insect poop eh, or insect scat. Um, you often find them in the uh, in a notch or crotch in a, um, a black cherry tree. They're already hatching and maybe even forming nests now as we speak. We're, you know, it's later into March. Um, so you see them earlier in the year. So if you see them earlier in the year, that's, that's who this is. Um, there are some species that can be even more problematic. I feel like around here, and maybe it's just because we don't have a lot of cherry orchards, it's not as big a deal or it's not as big a concern when you do find these. And and they are definitely an earlier in the year uh, species as far as doing this. So you see all the caterpillars here, and eventually you'll see, is that my next picture? Oh, no. Whoops. And eventually you'll see um, the caterpillars on the move and they're away from the nest. And once they're away from the nest, they're going to find a place to pupate before they become an adult. And this is what the adult actually looks like. I think they're you know, it's not a, a, a this massively beautiful butterfly, but I think they're a really neat. Um, we got a really neat coloration here, and so this is the eastern tent caterpillar moth, uh, which is this, the, which is the uh, the same species. This is just the adult uh, of these larvae. Um, one of the um, the stories that um, you may or may not realize was part of this. Um, back in two thousand one, uh, there was a I don't know if I should say outbreak or spate of uh, foal uh, and mare deaths in um, the thoroughbred industry, and it was a really big deal. Uh, and they couldn't figure out what was going on for a long time, and they finally narrowed it down to these caterpillars. And what was happening was they had a really, really dry snap in March, uh, where it got really hot and dried out. Uh, and then there was a cold snap, and everything froze and then thawed, and that triggered an extra amount of um, 
uh, production of this uh, prussic acid or this hydrocyanic acid in the leaves of the cherry trees. And then you had a really good crop of um, these tent caterpillars at the time. And so they were chewing and they were uh, pooping and in their in their frass was a lot of this this acid. So the acids um, being left behind by these ten caterpillars and dropping into uh, the grass and other things that the the, the um, horses are eating, uh, and and some of these leaves are falling as well from those really tough conditions. And so that was all getting taken up into the um, into the bellies of the mares. Uh, it was really affecting the, the foals. There was a lot of still stillbirths uh, where they were not born. There was a lot of foals that were born and they had respiratory issues and even some eye issues. Uh, and it took them, you know, it took them, I think, a couple months, but they eventually um, sleuthed through all the, the indicators and all the information and figured out that it was coming from uh, these 10 caterpillars. And so, um, you know, one of the things you'll see a lot about recently is, yeah, maybe you don't want... Uh, cherry trees uh, next to areas where your livestock are grazing um, because the cherry trees and or you know any of the the leftovers from these uh, caterpillars can cause some real issues with your livestock and your horses uh, whoops i forgot i'd circled that um now you'll have maybe two three years where uh these tent caterpillars are really really making a difference and there's a lot of you know, 10 caterpillars and they really have uh, a really big impact. And then they kind of start to, that impact starts to wane. You don't see them as robustly. And what happens is, you know, you get the 10 caterpillars around long enough and eventually the predators and the um, the parasites find them. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know if this is specifically a type of, of wasp that parasitizes the, um, the 10 caterpillars or not, but this is a wasp in the Braconid family. Um, Bracana wasps, there's a lot of parasitic wasps in the Bracana wasps. Uh, and one of the things that they'll do is they will attack, I shouldn't say attack I, uh, so much as they will find and locate caterpillars. They will sting them. They lay their eggs inside the caterpillar. Their larvae feed on the tissues of the caterpillar, but they stay away from the essential organs until uh, as, as long as possible. Um, but they're eating away at, at all the rest of these caterpillars. And then eventually, uh, when the larvae have enough, have eaten enough that they're ready to pupate, they emerge through the skin or the exoskeleton of the caterpillar and form a cocoon right on the outside of the caterpillar. <coughs> Excuse me. A lot of times by this point, um, the caterpillar is not moving much anymore because of all the consumption of its inside tissues. These are, I said, I say parasite, but these are actually parasitoids. That caterpillar is not going to live. It's not going to eventually pupate into a catalpa sphinx. This is not a... Um, a 10 caterpillar, but it's a very similar uh, cycle for many different caterpillars, what happens with these wasps. Uh, and this is a close-up of the eggs, and you can see the little caps where the the, the new wasps have emerged. Um, and again, this is a Catalpa Sphinx. We have a Catalpa right next to our pond. We see this every summer uh, at Gulf Branch. But it happens to several other caterpillars. And I've been lucky enough to find this on a, not lucky for the caterpillars, but I've been lucky enough to, to see this on several different types of caterpillars. So it definitely happens on many different species. And one of those species is um, uh, these eastern tent caterpillars. There's also egg parasites that can really reduce the numbers as well. Uh, there are some ichneumon wasps. This is a hoverfly parasitoid wasp, um, but it doesn't just specialize in hoverflies. It may also, you know, um, parasitize um, Lepidoptera, which I don't know if it actually includes Eastern Tank Caterpillar or not, but it is from that group. And you can see it's a really tiny wasp, you know, that Braconid wasp there, also not very big. These are really tiny wasps, but they can have a major impact on uh, different types of, of insect species uh, when they're around. <clears throat> A little dry, uh, and then of course there are bigger predators. On the on the right is uh, of course a Baltimore Oriole, uh, Orioles and cuckoos. This one on the left is a yellow-billed cuckoo. Um, uh, and they'll both feed on uh, eastern tent caterpillar tents. I really like when I can find the tent caterpillars, uh, and one of the places I I feel like I see them see a pretty good job is um i see a pretty good amount of them is down in occoquan national wildlife refuge in woodbridge uh and i think in fact i think that one picture with all the caterpillars next to each other is, is from there um and i like being in areas where those are because that means i've got a chance to get it to see or hear a cuckoo these are our whoops Cuckoos are, I think, locally uncommon. Like you'll find them occasionally. I've heard them at Gulf Branch. Um, I know they've been seen in Arlington, and they're, you know, they're seen in Northern Virginia. But they're just, they're very secretive. They don't just come out and show themselves very often. 
Um, and typically when I see one, it's very exciting because it's like you see it behind the leaves and all of a sudden it pops out for a second and it's back in and it's like, woo, there's a cuckoo. Um, perhaps that's why they make the clocks the way they do. Um, so they're again, they're very secretive, but they do like to eat the eastern tent caterpillars and so when they are in season then they have the tents out you know there's cuckoos about and so you want to keep your eyes and your ears open for them um another uh neat interaction that um um uh, not for the tent caterpillars is the um allegheny allegheny mound ants uh as one species of ant although i think there are several that do this uh, but these ants like to also get on the cherry trees and remember i talked about those twin nectaries on the leaf stalks <clears throat> they like to go for those nectar sources and they will um you know fight with and actually you know actively remove caterpillars that are on the tree so that they don't have competition for those nectar sources i don't know how much those caterpillars are actually um going to compete with the ants for that nectar source but they will remove them as a result and so you can have a interaction between the caterpillars including the tent caterpillars uh between them and different types of ants like these allegheny uh, mound builders so uh you know i'm doing a lot of talking here about moths why are moths so important uh well adult moths moths do a lot of pollination and they're not always very um they're not always necessarily uh, species specific so you get different moths that will do different types of pollinating but moths can really help us understand um an area and and how um Oh, how diverse it is and, and often biodiversity is a nice um, indicator of how healthy an ecosystem is. Um, hopefully you're aware that um, one way of, of checking the uh, the health of a, an aquatic ecosystem is by looking for macroinvertebrates like this crane fly larva, like this net spinner lar uh, larva over here on the right, this caddis fly. Um, but the amount of moths that are in an area as well. I, I actually did this um, uh, at, a, at a previous workspace, but uh, you know, I, I think the results still stand. This was um, when I was working up in Reston, and there was uh, a ton of moths that you would find on the 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 building in the morning from you know the security lights. You got to have some security lights, unfortunately, so you get some moths. And I think I documented over a hundred plus species, and you know that the, all those species don't have the same host plant, so it's really uh, a testament to how healthy that uh, environment is. We don't quite have the same. This is a on the side of this building was like the cypress siding with lots of really great footholds for these moths, um, and we don't quite have that same kind of space at um, Gulf Branch. But I have found a lot of different moss species there as well, and I think that that speaks pretty well to it. Um, and certainly, when you have something that's so um, important to so many different species or can be used by so many different species like black cherry that certainly is is a good uh way of improving or or keeping your ecosystem very healthy um uh and one last note here as i wrap up you know we use it as well um black cherry can make some really fine furniture some really prized and really nice furniture uh black cherry has been used in um oh I say, oh it's been used in liquors you know, there's something called cherry bounce, but every every cherry bounce I looked up online that I could see was all stuff made by more commercial type of cherries and not really this, the black cherries from uh, from North America. So I didn't do that. Um, but this wild cherry bark cough syrup, and I blocked out the name there um, because I didn't want to promote them. And I'm not sure how safe this is. You know, if you've got actual black cherry in there, which is this prussic acid, that's, that's really not good. It was used as a cough syrup in the past, but uh, it's not always a really good idea. Um, so, but it, it does occasionally get used for that and, and perhaps there's a use to it. I just, it would not be something I would recommend. And so, um, there's that, you know, but there has always been traditional uses for different kinds of, of plants. And sometimes they are very much rooted in, in an actual efficacy. And sometimes it's just, uh, wishful thinking. So I, I cannot tell a lie, uh, speaking of wishful thinking, I can't tell a lie. I am really appreciative that. Uh, that all of you join me tonight uh, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen uh, and uh, check out the chat and in the meantime if anybody wants to ask any questions please feel free to unmute and um, ask away so will deer browse the saplings that's a really good question I don't Noreen I don't know I don't know if they'll get in there and do that. Like I said, um, I've, I've seen both sides of yes, they will eat the the um, the leaves and, and no, they won't. So I'm not entirely sure 
um, what the actual truth there is. <clears throat> and again, maybe it's, you know, in um, in a tough patch, you can eat some of these leaves and it's not going to get you there. Um, but I don't think that, um, I, I'm not entirely sure either way which they'll do that. Um, and whether they would eat the saplings, that's a really good question. I had to, I'm going to have to check on that and get back to you. Um, do galls hurt the tree and or the leaves? So I can't say that there's no impact. Certainly if the, if the tree, uh, you know, any type of gall, uh, oak apple galls are another example. It's this really neat little, you know, um, green circular structure that's produced by this. Um, and, you know, inside a, a wasp develops and eventually emerges. And obviously some energy from the tree is spent doing that. Uh, I tend to think it's very much not, it's nothing that's going to be fatal or detrimental unless it's like, you know, there's 500,000 or something on the tree. Um, so is there a cost? Yes. Is there a, a high cost that can affect the health of the tree? Um, I don't think that um, with the with the regular number of galls that it's going to be that big a deal. Uh, does black knot tend to attack smaller diameter branches? Um, that's a really good question. I actually had a um, another picture of black knot that I didn't use, and it was this massive look like a burl like almost like this big um i think it was like this big on the trunk of a tree so it can get pretty big um and maybe it's just easier to uh infect uh the smaller branches at least in, initially in order to uh gain entrance um but they will i have seen them on on much larger branches as well calling this cherry in the yard with sharp spines on the trunk and branches oh, i'm not sure what kind of cherry that is doesn't sound like black cherry though um that would be a good question for the extension um when i think of sharp spines i think of things like devil's walking stick or um, um i can't think of the the now but it's got a compound leaf but it's definitely i don't think of cherries um but you know if it's producing cherries and that might, might be a, a non-native or a cultivar and that's uh, like i said a good question for uh, the local extension no black cherry is not the only north american tree cherry tree there are several species uh, black cherry is the largest of the north american cherry trees so there's several more species uh black cherry is the the largest and i think in the east it's it's one of the the better known uh and easier to find um I think a lot of them, they're, they're, they get, they're much smaller and they're not really, sometimes they might not even be considered full on trees like um, black cherry can be. Do leaves of other cherry species tend to be toxic? I think that is a, um, um, something that you'll find in the, the, the genus Prunus, uh, that you will find other, others of those species have toxic foliage as well. Perhaps not all of them, but I think there are several more that have that as well. I feel like choke cherry is the same way. So it's probably true for, um, several of those other ones, several of those other species. Good hard hitting questions tonight. Um, any other questions I can answer? Where's my head? There we go. Well, um, thank you. Oh, okay. What kind of cherry did George Washington chop down? Well, if he actually chopped one down, uh, it was probably an ornamental. I remember I, from my husband, <laughs> I, I literally just read that the other day. Like uh, a lot of times when I'm doing these, I'm like very obsessed with my, my first and last slide are going to look like. Uh, oh, you're welcome. Thank you. And so I was trying to find that um, that story and it's uh, I think it's generally considered apocryphal now but um, it was one of the his father's prize cherries which means it probably was not a native cherry it was probably something that was ornamental and brought over from Europe um, that you know if that did happen that's what it would have been um, but uh, you know when I think of cherry trees it's you know I remember learning that story about George Washington in like first grade and so it's always stuck with me well you're welcome everybody thanks I have um you know, if, if you need to go, that's kind of all I have. If anybody has any more questions and want to, um, um, you know, ask away, unmute and ask or, or put them in the chat, that's great. Otherwise, thanks for joining me tonight. And um, This is my second one in two nights and I am ready for a little rest. So I appreciate everybody joining me tonight and I, I really thank you for all the kind words. A book I can re recommend on cherries. There is not, Yolanda, but I will say 
Um, one of the books that I use for this is the, oh, hold on. I want to pull it up here. Um, you can't find it in print necessarily anymore, but I got a Kindle, which has actually been, um, I've actually really enjoyed it even more because I can just do some research anytime in there. It's called uh, The Book of Forest and Thicket. Uh, and when I send out the email with the link, I'll make sure I put that in there. Uh, it's by John Eastman uh, with illustrations by Amelia Hansen. It's um, it's a fantastic book. And there's a whole series. They got like the birds of as well. Oh, but the book of force and thicket, I think there's one that's like field and roadside and there's one that's swamp and marsh or something. Uh, and they're all really good books. And each one, each of them has a section on a certain plant and then they go through the different associates from you know, insects all the way up to vertebrates. A really good books and, and I really enjoy, you know, the information that's in there. And again, they're from, like that book came out, I hate to say this, that book came out right around the time I started my career. So they're like 20, 30 years old. Um, so there's some doubt dated information there. Like they referred to Northern Orioles, which Northern Oriole is now two species. It's the Baltimore Oriole and the um, Bullock's Oriole, which, and so it was split. You know, so there's some some dated information in there, and they don't use a lot of of as many scientific names for like vertebrates and stuff, which I think would be helpful. But uh, really good books on this stuff. Um, Thanks, Ken. No worries. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you. Good Thanks. Evening, You're welcome, everybody. And Ken. Bye. No problem. Bye bye. <laughs> no, you were not. You were not crazy to see a cuckoo at uh, Long Branch. Um, well, what's that's ironic awesome. it is such I'm such a bad birder, but me of all people saw a cuckoo, and nobody believed me. Noreen, you can sure. see any bird you want to see. Any bird you want to <laughs> well, see. Well, um, I'm sure of what I saw, and nobody believed me. Well, I, I and it's funny because it, I'm thinking about it. I think the first year I did the the capital uh, the city nature challenge, I heard one. You know, never saw it, and I'm like, I had to do like a, a casual observation of. It. I'm like, no one's ever gonna believe this. But I remember hearing one um, from the ridge above the nature center at, at Golf Branch. So there, yeah, they're out there, and it, you know, they're very secretive. One of the best places I've I've had for seeing them is is, is Occoquan. Um, there's a couple places where I, I I tend to be a little more alert and look for them. Um, and I've also seen them along um, the Maryland side of Great Falls. Um, I like to do the Billy Goat Trail and then take the emergency exit, as, as they call it, or their, the cut through, so you don't do the whole Billy Goat Trail. So I go down and then I do that and I come back up the the canal way. And, and I've seen them on both the um, the trail along the river and the, the trail along the canal. Um, so it's one of the better spots. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can tell you, I don't know how many sightings I have. It's not many, but I can tell you where I saw one at Harpers Ferry. I can tell you where I've seen them at, uh, like I said, at Great Falls, where I've seen them at, at Aquaquan, they just it's always very exciting. It's one of those birds I love to see. I can tell you where I saw one at Blackwater in Maryland. Um, just my favorite birds to one of my favorite birds to spot because they're such a challenge. Because you really got to be patient. Once you think you're on it, you got to be patient and wait for them to make that one moment where they kind of break cover because they just they don't. They just you know they stay pretty well concealed. Yeah, I was lucky. It flew right in front of me. Or yeah. Right, oh, you can't right my head. It was right out in the open. And nice. searched for a moment or two to the point where I was sure of what I was looking at, and then it took off, and I didn't see it again. Oh yeah, you got a better look than, than I most. did get a good look. Yeah, yeah. one cool. and only, <laughs> be the one yeah. and only time for me, I'm sure. Very nice. Thanks, Ken. Go get some rest. That I will. I am. I have uh, a lot of loafing. I'm planning on doing the rest of this tonight. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Good night. Uh, I hear a cuckoo clock. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> we had one growing up. I love that thing. My and my grandparents. It's my favorite clock. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. I'm gonna check out. Have a good evening.